the Ukrainian parliamentary elections took place on July 21st, 2019. Earlier, on April 21st, Volodymyr Zelensky achieved a landslide victory in the second and final round of presidential elections. In the parliamentary elections, Zelensky's party, Servant of the People, Sluha Narodu, gained a historic single-party majority in parliament, winning 254 of 450 seats. Several other parties were able to achieve 5% of the vote and make it into parliament. These parties are Opozitsina Platforma za Zhitya, Opposition Platform for Life, led by Yuri Boyko, Batkyushchina Vse Ukrainske Objednanya, All Ukrainian Union Fatherland, led by Yulia Tymoshenko, Europejska Solidarność, European Solidarity, led by former President of Ukraine Petro Poroshenko, and Holos, Voice, led by popular musician Svetoslav Vakarchuk. President Zelensky, with his resounding political victories, has been given a clear mandate by the citizens of Ukraine. They want change. However, the majority of Ukrainian citizens voting abroad gave their vote to Petro Poroshenko, as they had earlier in the presidential elections. Today, I speak about some issues associated with the 2019 Ukrainian elections process and the work of the Ukrainian World Congress, with Eugene Chuli, the head of mission of the Ukrainian World Congress International Observation Mission to Ukraine's 2019 elections. Hello, Eugene, how are you? Very good, yourself? Good, it's nice to see you again. Same here, Tanya. Uh, so, the parliamentary elections uh, in Ukraine are over and Volodymyr Zelensky's party has achieved a majority of seats in parliament. Uh, but I understand that although the elections were deemed democratic, the tendrils of Russian disinformation uh, were palpable throughout. I wonder if you could elaborate on that. Tanya, let me, uh, as usual, not respond immediately to your question, <laughs> but uh, do an introduction, otherwise you would not recognize me. <laughs> so, as during the presidential election, uh, during these parliamentary elections, we had uh, a substantial mission, uh, the fourth largest uh, during the parliamentary election. Um, we had uh, 142 short-term observers uh, and uh, together with our member organization, the Ukrainian Congress Committee of America had 174 short-term observers uh, that uh, monitored the election in 20 oblasts and we were, uh, uh, during the presidential election, the only uh, election observation mission that monitored uh, the elections in 23 countries outside of Ukraine, where Ukrainians were entitled to vote. Uh, in addition to our short-term observers, we had actually even a more substantial number during the parliamentary elections in that we had 125 long-term observers uh, that were monitoring in 28 countries in 20 languages uh, to the, the extent to which Russian disinformation would portray the electoral process as a, an unfair one, a non-democratic one, and uh, downplay uh, uh, the success of uh, that election, and at the same time portray Ukraine as a failed state. And as you've indicated, from our perspective, what we have uh, uh, provided in our preliminary observations is that the elections were democratic, that there were minor violations that one sees in just about any election, uh, but the, in, in no way did, they, did that affect the results of uh, the election, nor were they systemic uh, violations. In terms of the elections per se, the biggest violation was the Russian aggression in eastern Ukraine and the illegal occupation of Crimea that, as a result uh, of such aggression, 26 uh, seats in the parliament of Ukraine will be empty in that uh, 12 seats in Crimea and 14 seats in eastern Ukraine in the occupied territories of the Donbass. Uh, uh, will not be filled uh, because Ukrainian citizens are, were not entitled 
to elect uh, in those uh, regions that are currently illegally occupied by the Russian Federation. That, from our perspective, and as we have indicated, is the biggest violation of this parliamentary election, uh, which Ukraine, unfortunately, cannot settle on its own. Uh, it needs the international community to continue applying pressure in order to ensure that uh, eventually the Russian Federation complies with its uh, legal obligations, international obligations, uh, and leaves uh, Ukraine's territories. In terms of your uh, question, Tanya, uh, uh, regarding disinformation, uh, we have uh, clearly concluded in, in our preliminary observations that disinformation is an integral part of the Russian hybrid aggression. Our long-term observers have uh, been able to pick up various stories in various uh, countries uh, whereby either Ukraine continues to be portrayed as a failed state, uh, the governing authorities are being portrayed as neo-Nazis, and we had actually one of uh, the most ridiculous uh, narrative uh, to the effect that the parliamentary election was the most uh, corrupt uh, since uh, Ukraine gained its independence, and that there were so many violations that one cannot even call them an election. That flies directly in the face of the totally different assessment made by recognized international election observation missions, such as the OSCE, uh, Animal Canadam, uh, a delegation from the European Parliament, the Ukrainian World Congress, that have uh, assessed uh, these elections as uh, we have assessed the presidential elections this year as being democratic and meeting the standards for democratic elections. So, Eugene, uh, what do you make of the fact that uh, Russia has blacklisted the Ukrainian World Congress and did so on the eve of the parliamentary elections in Ukraine? <laughs> I think that the uh, uh, blacklisting of the Ukrainian World Congress uh, comes as uh, part of the Russian hybrid aggression against Ukraine and the Ukrainian people. Uh, the, the intent uh, from the Russian Federation is to cut off the uh, large, very large Ukrainian diaspora in the Russian Federation in that uh, people that uh, in the Russian Federation that work with an undesirable uh, organization, quote unquote, uh, uh, are susceptible of fines, confiscation of property, and for repeat offense uh, for imprisonment. So clearly, uh, the Ukrainian World Congress has served as a network that enabled uh, the Ukrainian diaspora and the Russian Federation to have a contact with Ukrainians elsewhere in the world. Uh, and, and this blacklisting essentially creates a roadblock in order to ensure, uh, or, or at least the intent is to ensure that the uh, uh, Ukrainian diaspora and Russian Federation is isolated from the rest of uh, the Ukrainians, both in Ukraine and outside of Ukraine. And uh, besides the Ukrainian World Congress sort of standing up for itself in its own defense, who has stood by the Ukrainian World Congress in, in this blacklisting? Uh, clearly, the, uh, the Ukrainian authorities have condemned uh, this action. And uh, I think at this stage, uh, the Ukrainian World Congress is evaluating what should be the next steps uh, in addressing this issue. And we'll, we will probably see in, in the next uh, days uh, a concrete plan of action in order to address this issue. I'm Tanya Stech, and this was Ukraine in the News. Canal Odentus Odente Perdostopni Nobel International Program. 